Kublai. When you return to the West, will you repeat to your people the same tales you tell to me? Kublai Khan speculates, will Marco's Western contemporaries have the capacity to imagine a culture unlike their own? The asking suggests Kublai Khan is a skeptic. Marco, I speak and speak, but the listener retains only the words he is expecting. Marco, again the skeptic. Marco, again the skeptic, anticipates anticipates the local Genoese will only be receptive to the standard pro forma they've been conditioned to hear. The Kublai Khan Marco Polo dialogue suggests two enduring postulates. One, the historic response to the prospect of discovery is often delivered and received with skepticism. Two, self designated as the arbiter of international culture, the West often rules out, ipso facto, the promise of other cultures. In the contemporary design discourse, the potentially complex narrative of building in China is often read simply as an extended venue for Western architecture. As the famous German philosopher admonished the West, no one tells us anything new, so we tell ourselves our own story. But who tells China's story? Maybe Young Ho Chang. Marco Polo was a rarity, a citizen of East and West, whose double vision connected both cultures but prioritized neither. That dual non-allegiance is a cultural and intellectual rarity. Young Ho Chang, another inhabitant of both and neither, also makes the double vision case. Marco's text admixes adventure, admiration, and analysis on tour in the service of the Khan, a new world through new eyes, and the old world seen anew, a consequence of his cafe travel log. Marco's wide-eyed openness implicitly posits an ideal of enduring curiosity and cultural non-allegiance. That aspiration is difficult to locate in the, in the contemporary architecture discourse, which chases and applauds homogeneity as grounds for business as business, rather than discovering what is idiosyncratic in each culture as a basis for new understanding. Young Ho Chang has reconstituted that idiosyncratic China discourse which should modify, which should modify both what the West thinks of China and what the West thinks of itself. Sun Tzu's, Lao Tzu's, Sun Yat-sen's, long marches, hundred flowers, and great leaps forward are profound evidence over millennia of China's experimentation with every poetic and political prospect. Young Ho Chiang advocates that exploratory precedent in architecture. Where else but China do we find Lao Tzu's great square with no corners? Great square with no corners. Build that one if you can. But it's not only the West's reluctance to enjoin a dual architecture citizenship, there is also substantial interest in China in outwesting the West in pursuit of that most up-to-date urban imagery much known and prized.
from the Potsdamer Platz to Fifth Avenue. This is not as much an, an admonition of the conceptual single-mindedness of contemporary Western urbanism and it is, as it is a sense that an, that an alternative, less formulaic architecture and urban prospect will inevitably emerge from that Chinese long march of urban wandering. Obligate the enemy to fight on the ground with which he is unfamiliar, Sun Tzu directs. Chinese architecture should do no less than to position itself on Sun Tzu's unfamiliar ground, directs Young Bo Chang. Please welcome that dual D-U-E-L, that dual citizen Young Bo Chang to Sire. extremely poetic uh, introduction. However, I'm afraid after that introduction there's only could be a disappointment. Uh, I'll try. I don't know if I could bring the Gospels uh, from the Middle Kingdom. Uh, but I, know, uh, I can uh, share with you uh, um, at least some of my experience. I think uh, you know, that's something I'm planning to do. Kind of? sure. If you have read the uh, announcement for uh, my lecture, so there was an argument about the project and the other project. So basically I'm saying that today there is a particular kind of uh, architectural project, the big, the uh, iconic, and the uh, international. So that's the project. And, and our office been working on maybe the other project, the small, uh, not, not so iconic, maybe uh, more uh, uh, like you know, urban fabric, and, and then uh, we uh, have been trying to be local. So anyway, that argument is in a way about they versus us. However, today at uh, uh, SIR, you know, for a number of reasons, uh, for this you know, really great school of architecture, and then for the fact that uh, Halloween is uh, approaching imminently, right? we have two, two, three nights. I would like to uh, present a slightly different version of this argument. It's still about the projects and the other projects, but rather the projects and the other projects in my, my office. Uh, so anyway, so I'll start with the project. It's pretty straightforward. So our office, um, we, we do architectural design, we do urban design. In a way, architecture and earth, urbanism is uh, you know, the mainstay of our, our firm. So I'd like to show uh, two uh, projects, just give you an idea of the type of work we do. Uh, first one is a house we built in uh, uh, 2002, as you can see. Um, so the idea was very much built upon the prototypical houses in the city of Beijing. And however, since we're moving the Koyar house, oh, uh, I'm sorry, it's not really focused, I'm afraid, is it? Maybe I'm already jet lagged, it, it only looks sort of blurred to me. Uh, so, you, yeah. so anyway, so the idea of a courtyard house for me is very important since I grew up in one anyway. When we did this project, gradually I realized courtyard house is such a kind of urban prototype. You can't just transplant it into the uh, open landscape. So we started to reconfigure that idea of a courtyard house. So what you're looking at is half of a house, and then the other half could be landscape or topography. So together, they would have formed a, a, a courtyard. So it becomes a courtyard house in the open landscape. So it depends on the uh, uh, topography, so they can, the house can have the opportunity to assume very different uh, configurations. And then we ended up 
building the one there. And then here is the site. So courtyard right in the middle, as usual, half of it is enclosed by architecture, the other is enclosed by nature, by a slope. And then by doing so, we were able to save all these trees in the middle as well. And then here you see the two wings. And then we approach the house. <coughs> you actually go in right in the connection of these two ways. And we, uh, um, at the beginning of the project, learned that uh, the site was planned for a national uh, tourist park. But typically in China, it, that was an idea, but nobody's gonna uh, actually put in money to uh, build a park, the land was sold to the developer to build houses. Uh, we could actually refuse to participate in such kind of a capitalist project, but yet we decided maybe we could participate and then took on a slightly different kind of position than the typical development. So we are arguing here that maybe we could build a house which eventually can disappear. So we use the red earth as you can see here, also a laminated wood. Not so much to make a connection with the past. So that's you know, something we, we, we welcome anyway. But more so, we're trying to say that maybe one day the land will be given back to a, a park. So we uh, actually explore these technologies which are long lost ourselves, that help internationally from architects in Europe and, and from Korea and so on. And, and then so we built these uh, um, run earth walls from the outside and then it opens up to the courtyard on the inside. So the slope completes the enclosure of the outdoor space. And then you can go up to the uh, uh, terraces and then the house is very symmetrical so there are two living, I'm sorry, bedrooms on top of that wing and two more on this side. And then on the terraces, you get to see the landscape around it. And then you can look back onto the house and, and as well, you know, as the central courtyard. And here is the, uh, uh, the entry hall. The reason the, uh, the entry hall um, has a glass floor is uh, because of uh, a stream going down there. So we want uh, that stream to be part of the entry. And here is a powder room. So when you use a toilet, and uh, you can see two streams coming down. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so it, it is a glass floor even in the, uh, in the, in the powder room. And then looking out from the living room, the living room itself. And then you see the laminated frame. So at that time when we built the house, that technology wasn't uh, available. Blue lamp, at that time, were already, I think, imported uh, from the United States to China. It was too expensive, so we uh, um, came up with our own recipe, and then we collaborated with a furniture company. So these are, in a way, homemade uh, you know, blue lamp. So that's an architectural project. You know, it is a house. It is about uh, uh, these rather basic conditions uh, of architecture, program, size, material, and so on. And this one uh, is for one of the, uh, uh, the largest software companies in China, Ufida. Um, and that's their research and development uh, uh, part. Uh, outside of, on the, on the edge of uh, Beijing. So the issue at stake, or rather two issues actually. One is that we, we realize the way computer programmers work are different from the typical nine to five. Rather, they are, they are similar to uh, architects. They may start late in the evening, uh, uh, morning, and then they go on and on and on in the evening and even would uh, stay all night uh, in, their, uh, uh, you know, the, in their office. 
So I, I'm hesitant to use the word office. So in a way, it's really more than an office. It rather, it's almost kind of a living environment these people uh, you know, these folks would, would really need. So what you can see here, you see a lot of uh, you know, Bruce Lee's and Jackie Chan's, and there are just people, you know, these uh, computer people uh, doing their exercise. They don't do enough now, and then they really should. And then there are a lot of uh, opportunities for them to, to uh, socialize, to, uh, to uh, uh, exchange ideas, uh, communicate, and so on and so forth. So they work as teams, and then they work long hours. So what we have done is again to draw ideas from the courier house typology. In this case, more the courier houses as the urban fabric, and to create a work environment which would allow them to be with nature more and, and to uh, hopefully be uh, uh, more healthy. And the site is on the outskirts of the city, and typically the client would have wants a, a 20 story building. And then we said, no, no, uh, it's actually better if you have a three story building. You can really take advantage of the site. Each floor is unique. The ground floor is connected with the ground, obviously, and the top floor is connected with the weather, with the sky, and then the middle floor, of course, is suspended from the earth and the sky. So they bought our idea, and then we built a three-story building. And then the program of the, the, the different kind of needs, uh, as I described, and would it eventually evolve into a, 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 a kind of a match building, you know, match building very much uh, in the uh, uh, modernist sense, you know, like Le Corbusier's uh, Venice Hospital uh, in some ways. So here, however, what's interesting, of course, is not so much where did that tradition come from, but rather to say for any MAC buildings, there is a social programmatic uh, underpinning which was very important for, from the project. So the program leads to uh, the, uh, uh, the kind of a uh, uh, Mac building a typology. And then you see uh, these uh, logos are being used uh, to illustrate uh, the different areas of the ground floor. And then, now, today, uh, this is a good day. So they, uh, of course, they are out there uh, during lunch break. I was there on a very, very cold winter morning. And they still take a walk. You know, it's going to be uh, maybe 10 minutes versus half an hour or something. So uh, it, it, our idea in this case actually worked. And then here you can see up there. Somehow they have to, okay, here you go. And then they go out and then they, they do their uh, stretches and, and tai chi. So the project could expand like any other map building horizontally, uh, sorry, definitely, almost, ide ideally, if that's the case. And what's interesting for us, this project, is that there are small courtyards on this level, the bigger one on the ground, and so on. Altogether, it makes a kind of a fine-grained uh, urban fabric, and that was a very important idea for us. Uh, so that, really, uh, the idea of courtyard being transformed, maybe uh, to some extent at least, to a lot more flexible, not so much uh, traditional uh, form-driven kind of a new uh, uh, typology. And then here from the outside, of course, uh, you can see it is rather flat and expensive. Another view from the uh, outside of the complex, and then inside we uh, do uh, uh, we did the uh, landscape uh, as well as the architecture. So you can see also the idea already now evolves into something almost like the pixelation, uh, as such. But the idea really has to do with how we see these courtyards being 
part of the architecture being a room without roof. And then so that really courtyard, landscape, and the buildings would have formed a whole. And then you see the slightly erase of the topography in the courtyard in, in, in a very architectural way, or we think that that was the intention. And then different types of courtyard spaces. And then the scale of the buildings changes. So at point, it becomes rather low, and then the scale is more intimate. And layers of courtyards. And then on the upper level, terraces. So you can always have easy uh, access to the outdoor. In a, um, well, while we're promoting a uh, healthy lifestyle, but also uh, you know, we're pre pre uh, promoting, uh, in a way, also the freedom of uh, ha having a cigarette. I know it's politically incorrect to say in the US, but the reality in China is 90% of uh, men, at least, uh, smoke. Uh, so I, I, I do wish they smoke less, uh, but anyway. Uh, so terrace is on different levels. And a little courtyard for meditation or for a nap uh, on the uh, top floor. Entrance, office interior. We uh, invited glass blocks in the concrete blocks. Another uh, interior space. And uh, in the evening, you can see uh, the building. Uh, it is uh, uh, lit up by the uh, glass blocks as well as the windows. So anyway, so these type of projects are the projects for our office. Architecture, urbanism, again, urban design, and so on. It is probably, uh, I, I wanted to give you a percentage at this point would constitute at least that 75% of the work in the office. However, today, I want to present you the other projects in our office. So I, I was trying to uh, think how to define it. Maybe the best way is to, to say the other projects tend to be uh, the miscellaneous kind of a work and tend to be rather in a significant and tend to be rather trivial. And then what we have is the MIT project. You know, miscellaneous, insignificant, and trivial. So that's the definition of, of the other projects. We have been doing that actually all along. So the, one of the early ones I'd like you to see is a door we designed. You know, it's uh, in 98. It's a garage. And there were a pair of uh, metal uh, sliding doors. And now that they are having art exhibitions in there, they want to have a, a, a door for people, you know, a pedestrian door there. Well, they want to lock up the old garage doors, and the sliding doors. So what we did was to, to put a folding door frame and then a swing uh, door so that you, know, you can still close it and, and lock it. So that door uh, is called uh, a sliding, folding swing door. So anyways, uh, you know, it's not about uh, the, the rhetoric. But what's interesting, of course, uh, it is the kind of a thinking and, and, and uh, um, Really, ideas you can put in the door, perhaps just as much as any uh, bigger projects or the uh, uh, projects. So you see a building, uh, I'm sorry, people using that door. So that kind of project actually has become very important element in our practice. Although sometimes, you know, as small as a door, but it generates a kind of a, a, a innovation that would inspire uh, the bigger projects. So here uh, is an interior project. Often interiors are done uh, by interior firms in China. So for an architecture 
from the new interior are actually fairly uh, rare in China. So we did uh, uh, several of them. I'm showing you one. Uh, it's not a palace. It's, it's a restaurant called Palace. Uh, so I, it's the, the restaurants in Shanghai, I got really interested in the tradition of tile bread. It's very thin. It's about like three centimeters. It's for making ceiling in the, uh, uh, especially uh, buildings in gardens. I, I wonder if we should uh, uh, do a new kind of a um, tile ceiling for these uh, restaurants. And then we came up eventually with this uh, very, very low uh, technology. And as you can see, uh, it's to hang a piece of tile brick with uh, two uh, metal wires uh, with, of course, uh, a steel uh, armature. And then we create spaces like these. What you're looking at is a ceiling with a big open dining hall underneath and the private dining booth uh, on the uh, upper level. So the, uh, these kind of rolling uh, tiled skin really is either to uh, separate these two functions or bring them together. Typically, if you go to China, you have a big dining hall in one place and then you have a group of uh, dining rooms uh, uh, in, in, a, in a kind of rather separate way. So I would say actually it is what bring these two type of that dining experiences under one roof. So here you can see better uh, a private dining room right there. So and then by having the uh, tiles suspended from the wire, it creates a, a kind of a translucency. So it's not a, a, just a, a rather simple divide, but rather there is a, a light penetration happening along that surface. So here is a restaurant uh, in, uh, in action. I don't know if uh, anyone in the audience uh, has planned to uh, visit Shanghai. Uh, so if you do, let me know. This is, I, I recommend the restaurant, not really because of what we did, it's because of the food. You never go to a restaurant only to see the interior. Uh, they, they do uh, Nouveau uh, Cantonese dim sum. It's really, really fantastic. Um, I, I, I don't really know. I think uh, Los Angeles Chin uh, Chinatown probably has pretty good dim sum. But probably, you know, this is a little hard to beat. This quite, quite something. Uh, anyway, so another view of the ceiling. Again, these are the rooms. So interior, uh, that's a detail. You saw a door, you saw an interior. Oh, this is the bar. I'm sorry, there's a couple more. There's another dining room. Anyway, so uh, we also do uh, so-called art projects. For us, they're no different from any other uh, art, you know, architectural projects we do, but in reality, the uh, so-called art projects are for um, often the exhibitions. So this is one. We, we are currently working on a kind of a, uh, we, we work on all kinds of um, plastic structures. And this one is using bamboo as a veneer, but also just plastic inside. By bending the plastic, and then we could achieve some uh, uh, structural strengths. So we're testing the structure in our office, and this is an analytical uh, diagram of the structure, and then testing the translucency. And that's what we built ultimately for going through a Biennale this year in Korea. It's a two meter by two meter by two meter box. So one is closed, and I don't, it's not very obvious if actually the lights would have come up. So when it's open, the lights are off. So this is a, a close up of the material, so you can see the, uh, the bamboo of an ear. And then inside is a space. Again, we were asked to do something for, for meditation, for a, a dialogue. So the space would allow two people 
to, uh, to sit uh, face to face to have a conversation. So another view, and that's how people would use it. And, and, uh, and she's even having a, a good time. Uh, anyway, again, so you can see the quality of the interior space. And then this is, uh, uh, actually they don't need so many people to move it. Uh, um, but anyway, so the lights are on. So anyway, that's a tiny little project. However, for us, exhibitions and art project installations have been a way for our office to experiment with different materials and different technologies and ideas. So we already uh, are thinking of using that particular uh, technology for uh, a, a different uh, architectural design project. So another one, and it's also about plastic, is for the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. For a while, our office is working on a material, which again, if you, you happen to be in China, you'll, you'll see it. So on your left, it's a, a plastic actually it's polyethylene um, pavement block. So you used to pave uh, uh, parking lots and driveways and so on. It's porous so that uh, grass would be able to uh, 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 grow. And then that's why the color is uh, usually uh, of a, a ra ra rather intense shade of a green. And then uh, I I've been uh, using that material, of course, for painting for a while, and then realized there's a, quite a bit of a structural uh, strength in the material. Not only that one is laid flat, and if you flip up to use it in a, a, a vertical way, it would also uh, be possible. So we started to experiment uh, structures with that material. Again, this is our office. And then we, we, we put up a, a, a triangular plant, a little pavilion, just to test out the, its uh, structural quality. And then we started to do uh, something, it's, it's much bigger, you can see the one unit being multiplied into many. And, and then uh, uh, we, we were working on uh, different ways of strengthening the structure. What you see here basically is two layers of that material being composed in such a way that it would stiffen up the, the material uh, further and then create uh, this very lazy uh, uh, translucent look of it. And then here already is in London and then the, uh, these kind of awful greens started to work pretty well with the uh, not very pleasant red of uh, BNA and then creating a, a very uh, Christmassy uh, kind of atmosphere in the summer. And then, uh, so again, layers and layers of these spaces transforms entirely the uh, central courtyard at VNA. And then when Eric was talking about uh, Kublai Khan and Marco Polo, so that project, of uh, these projects, is the only one Actually, uh, we attract a lot of uh, comments about uh, 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 some people say uh, um, Moorish architecture. Uh, it's not that I, 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 I we certainly didn't think about that, but I do think there is a kind of a, a aesthetics which happened probably in an incidental way, but for 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 us, you know, from our house face started to bring us to a very different kind of aesthetics and, and the reaching out for that matter to the outside of China. It was uh, a, a very exciting for us. And then the little uh, peeping tongue and the taking advantage of the translucency. And uh, again, this an overall view of the uh, installation. There are a lot of uh, families visiting the museum on the weekends during the summer, so they actually took advantage of the structure. 
having picnics and being one of the pavilions and so on. And we also use the material for something a lot more modest. This is our own toilets uh, at uh, our uh, office. And uh, we uh, got some unusual uh, gray color supply from a manufacturer. So we, we uh, made a, a very light building. That's the whole point. We were at one point, we really, looked, really didn't have any uh, extra cash to even have a toilet. So we decided to, uh, to go green. You know, uh, when you had pressure, you know, you would do it. So we didn't want to make a foundation. So the lightweight, um, again, plastic made a lot of sense. And then the material uh, was actually donated by the manufacturer. We did a very inexpensive project with three details. A flat two-dimensional connection and a, a three-dimensional connection. Very crude, very basic. A piece of metal bent and two, uh, two uh, uh, bolts. And then insulation and privacy. We cut a bubble wrap and rolled them up. And, and put them in, in these uh, cells, honeycombs. Um, and then that's the insulation and the, uh, for, for visual privacy. We actually had a fancy nickname for it. This is called bubble wrap sushi. <laughs> <laughs> and here uh, you have the, uh, uh, the toilet. So anyway, it's the same material for the room and these are the bubble wrap sushi and so on. Our first idea is that, again, the project, or rather, this kind of exploration is not a, just a, a novelty. We like to think that building is going to be lighter and lighter, and material such as uh, polyethylene, because it's 100% recyclable, will be one day a major, major building material for, for, you know, uh, for the whole world. And more plastic. In this case, we uh, did something probably close to uh, a piece of furniture. And as you all know that in China, in Japan, in Korea, in that part of the world, there's a tradition of having these kind of folding screens. You have a wood frame and then you have a, a, a layer of a rice paper. Wood frame for structure and rice paper for light or for translucency again. And then we wanted to uh, update that version with a CNC uh, uh, milling machine here in uh, oh, this is in Shanghai. This is the largest one we could find. And then what we did is that we took the, the uh, um, Formica countertop, you know, kitchen countertop material. The brand name is called the uh, Surreal, and then sculpted in such a way that we would be able to achieve what wood and rice paper did in the past, but only with one material, of course, is the plastic. So this is the, the piece <coughs> being made and trying out the translucency and working out a hinge. Now we actually know better of the technology. We could actually sculpt even the hinge as part of the panel. But for that particular one, it was still uh, being uh, attached onto it. Again, part of the, the hinge. The kind of accuracy of the CNC milling machine actually not something can be achieved by traditional craftsmanship. So that's what's very, very exciting for us. So when we have the screen there, most people would associate this screen with the old screen, but yet there's something more than this different. And then, in fact, in order to really accentuate that difference, we uh, made the uh, screen, as you can see, thicker on one side and thinner on the other. So there's a, a you know, gradation, a change of light quality from one side to another. This is a four uh, millimeter, I'm mean, sorry, 40 millimeters on the thicker side and the four on the other. And then again, uh, because of the texture of this plastic, so you start to, to uh, uh, be a little confused as to, 
to what the material really is, and uh, rather also where is the wood and where is the paper, but in fact, it's neither, it's a, a plastic. And then only at a certain angle, the shininess of it starts to reveal itself as a third material. So, next project is something very different. When I talk about some of these projects, I know that I, I'm not sure if I can say if they are architectural or not. But some projects, I know for sure they are not architectural. So this is one of the projects uh, uh, aren't directly related to architecture. But I like to think that the, the, the working method or uh, the way of thinking is related to architecture after all. So this is a fruit. Actually, you know, I don't really have the knowledge if we have it in, in uh, the United States or in California. I think the English word is a board. In the Chinese, it's a uh, hulu. Uh, so anyway, so you can see there are two different forms, and and you know uh, you you have to have a, a, a trellis at least to let it grow. And traditionally, what we do, I think, I have another image of it. You know you. We, we take the fruit in northern China, we, we, uh, it's a long tradition. You dry it up, and then you cut it, and right in the, in the middle, and then you scoop out the, uh, the inside anyway. And then it becomes uh, a utensil. So you use it to uh, scoop up water, rice, and, and so on. It's still uh, it's being widely used. So we decided maybe we could grow, uh, you know, gores uh, with today's technology. So here is in a factory, in the, this for uh, people who are from uh, China in this audience. This is from Tangshan, a city not far from Beijing. So we uh, uh, designed and made this, uh, uh, it's a set of Bong uh, China. I just got new bone china. It's not real, uh, uh, you know, animal bones in the uh, uh, in the mix, but rather it is the, uh, again new technology. So and then you open them up, and then you can uh, you know, put uh, dishes inside. The big space is for the main dish, and uh, the little space is for a sauce and uh, for uh, some other spices and so on. So we we design a stand to hold them back together as board, and then it creates a, a kind of a table landscape. Um, just more pictures and details. More pictures. However, we had an idea, I'm not really sure if it works. We wonder if these rather regular shapes would allow them to be composed on the table in such a way it would have saved some uh, spaces on, on, the, on the table. So that picture is uh, uh, actually for that particular experiment. The different backgrounds. And then you see some uh, tiny little uh, baby uh, boards for salts and just for the soy sauce, whatever. Those two uh, little ones. One is made of uh, stainless steel. And then we went out with the same uh, idea, rather, to make uh, wine sets. So far we have been uh, two. One, uh, the bigger one is for uh, European wine. Uh, it's a, a decanter. Um, the other one is for Chinese uh, rice wine, the yellow wine. So you can have warm, you know, warmed up uh, wine in the, uh, uh, in, in this, uh, uh. anyway, the one that, uh, on the left, um, okay, here we go. And so the double layer glass will help you uh, uh, to keep the, the wine warm and then you don't have to hold up onto something too hot. And then these are the Chinese uh, uh, wine glasses. We did do a European wine glass as well. Uh, that's something, as you know, it really uh, can't be redesigned. Wine glass for Europe or America is a classical thing. 
So what we did is uh, very minimal. It's just a little dance on the bottom of it. I don't have a, a picture yet, but it just came out. So here is a Chinese wine uh, bottle with uh, uh, some substance inside, colored water, I think. It may not be real wine. And then a glass. So it's, anyway, okay, here is uh, the, the, the decanter uh, being used with uh, the, uh, the, the ceramics. So anyway, so I've shown you uh, an array of uh, uh, you know, the other uh, projects, the small, the, uh, the miscellaneous, and the, you know, the insignificant, maybe an inglorious would be the better word, because Tarantino probably is pretty uh, nearby. Uh, but uh, anyway, the point I made is that these projects, however small or insignificant they might be, but actually they are very much part of our pro uh, in the office and, and everyday thinking and, and pushing of these larger subject matter of architecture. So the last project I'd like to show is a project in a way combines the large and the small and the part of the more important, more iconic and whatnot. And then in the end, what matters is a project that's just a, a way for us maybe to explore these set of ideas. So plastic and lightweightness and other technologies now forms very much a focus in our office. So this building for the uh, Shanghai World Expo next year, actually it's gonna open on uh, May 1st, uh, became a way for us to, to really uh, integrate some of these interests. So this is a Shanghai corporate pavilion. It's gonna be in the uh, corporate pavilion area. Uh, actually, it's the, uh, the whole pavilion in this, in this area. And here is our site. And then this is already programs being transformed into the space. So basically we were given very specific programs in terms of uh, the size of the spaces, exhibition, what they are used for, uh, theater and uh, the queue on the ground floor and so on. So basically we, we literally translated the programs into these spatial diagrams and then enclosed them. So it became uh, spaces. And then our architecture had to do with a plastic Q-made infrastructure block and the way these functional spaces carved from it. The inspiration of the project is pretty obvious. Uh, it's actually the Centre Pompidou by Renzo Piano and uh, who's the other architect? Uh, Richard Rogers, I wonder, they work together. And at that time, if you remember the project, the infrastructure, all this that work was that big. That's something, and you know, I should have looked up. And never did it became a myth. Because uh, for electricity, for water at that time, all they need is something that thin. So maybe that's a kind of an expression, is uh, kind of a design move. So we decided to bring the dimension to its need. So we're talking about the five centimeter diameter plastic tube would have formed these scaffolding in a way. And then these are some uh, uh, drawings showing this whole block uh, of infrastructure with water going through them for different uh, purposes for collecting solar energy and, and uh, the solar energy actually would, would turn into hot water, heat first, and then in exchange into electricity. And then uh, uh, also uh, hot water, I'm um, sorry, water for making mist in the queuing area. And then electricity in different ways, LED lights and so on. So as you know, uh, for an expo, architecture is performing. Architecture is about uh, performance. 
So these are uh, study models of the structure. And then study models of the ground area. The whole building is elevated. So the ground floor becomes this uh, large viewing area. With, uh, uh, it's not very clear. And then with all the cubes on top. Going up to the uh, uh, in interior spaces. So the first mock-up, again, is in, in the courtyard of our office, outside of Beijing. And then this is in Shenzhen, in the factory of uh, an LED light manufacturer, trying out a, a six meter by six meter by six meter plot at night with mist. And we're doing this 3D LED, uh, meaning that the message, our images you see, is not flat. It can move back and forth, it can turn and so on. So anyway, this is uh, uh, the project under construction. And here is where the, uh, the theater is. Here is the, the Huanghu River, the bridge, and the other half of the, uh, the expo. And here's uh, uh, where the uh, exhibition will eventually be. And that's the uh, outside of the building about a week ago. So this, the, the interior, uh, or rather the exhibition, will, will start uh, very soon. So anyway, again, as I said before, in the end, it's not about two sets of different projects. Rather, there's only one project. We can call the project architecture or really whatever, but it really brings a lot of our, our interests and concerns and researches together. So I hope that uh, more of our projects would be able to go in this particular uh, direction. So this is pretty much the end of the talk. What you're looking at again is uh, uh, our office. And do we do other things than what I showed? Uh, the answer actually is yes. You see a glimpse of uh, another uh, activity in our office. It's uh, cultivation. We actually grow our own vegetables for, for lunch. And uh, this year we started to design furniture and, and clothing. Uh, so maybe I'll come back in two years and I'll show those. But anyway, thank you very much. And, uh, uh,